It's at an hour. Yeah, it's, it actually happens around 30 minutes. Can't figure out why it's doing that. All right, so we've got association areas. So <clears throat> tell me about the primary and the association areas. That's the basic understanding, right? That, that the primary areas do basic sensation, whereas the association areas do perception, right? Actually perceiving what something is versus just sensing whether or not it's there at all. So tell me about them. Which one is usually bigger? Association. The association areas. And, there, and there's dedicated areas for different senses, right? There's a primary visual cortex and then a visual association area. Do those two structures live far away or next to each other? Next to each other, right? And the same thing is true for live auditory information. There's a primary auditory cortex, and then there is an auditory association area, and they live right next to each other. There's a primary somatosensory cortex, and then a somatosensory association area. There's a primary motor cortex. <clears throat> Right? And, and so where do, the, where do the visual association cortices li live? So where, where does the primary visual area live? Occipital. Occipital lobe, right? Where does the somatosensory cortex live? On the parietal lobe, right? Where does the auditory cortex live? On the temporal lobe. But the primary areas are always right next to the associational areas, and that would make sense. Then there is an association area for the, all the other associational areas lives in the frontal lobe, lives in the very, very, very front part of the frontal lobe. The prefrontal cortex. It's where, it's where all that executive functioning is occurring, that decision-making, planning, and motivation in your prefrontal cortex. It takes in all the information from all the other association areas, makes a plan, goes, hey, premotor cortex, we're going to move. We're going to flee because that's a lion. And then you run. You run faster. Or don't hit him, because then we will go to jail. I know you want to hit him, but don't. Prefrontal cortex deciding not to hit. Does that make sense? Making a decision. All right. <clears throat> oh, one other thing. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so neurons are only specialized communication, right? What are those other cells then? that actually do the feeding and the clothing and the and the and all those other types of things for the neurons. What do you call those types of cells? Yeah. Glial cells. I would definitely know the different types of glial cells and what they do. So who can tell me the different types of glial cells and what they do? Yeah, my, my, my what? Phagocyte. Phagocyte, and a particular type of phagocyte is called a what? Microglia. 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 Phagocyte, and a special type of phagocyte is called a microglia, and that does like, let's kill the baddies. Kill the baddies in your brain. Viruses, other invading organisms. What other type of uh, glial cells are there? Astrocytes. Astrocytes, right? And what do they do? What? Yeah, so provide nutrients and also maintain a very special sodium chloride mixture on the outside of the neurons. That the actually the extracellular environment, astrocytes maintain that. And then what's another type of uh, what's what's the other type of astro? Uh, excuse me, glial cell. Only dendrocytes and Schwann cells do the exact same function. What do they do? They both make myelin sheath. Where do oblidendrocytes live? In the central nervous system, where do Schwann cells live? In the peripheral nervous system. Okay, Back to gross neuroanatomy. So talk to me about the somatosensory cortex. How is it laid out? How is it laid out? I showed you a picture of it. Showed you a picture, an artist rendering of the somatosensory cortex. Lives on the parietal lobe. It's all wibbly wobbly. It's got gyruses and fissures, gyri and fissures. A fissure is a little hot, is a little like hole. Yeah, a little right. hole. And the gyri is the sticky out part of the brain, right? It's got gyri and fissures. The entire cerebral cortex does. But how is it laid out? Is there a special part of the somatosensory cortex for your feet? 
Yeah. Oh, like a monkey. Oh, it's called a homunculus. I think is what you're thinking of. Yeah. Is there a special part of the somatosensory cortex for your feet? Is there another special part of the somatosensory cortex dedicated to your hands? Yeah. Is there another part dedicated to your lips? Yeah. yeah. Is there another dead part dedicated to your cheek? Yeah. Yeah, right? It's laid out in that fashion with different parts of your body having a, a special part of the somatosensory cortex. Which parts have the largest relative surface area? The lips and the hands, right? Much more brain area is dedicated to your lips and hands. Why? Because they're taking the most sensation. Yeah, because they have to take in the most sensation. They're the most sensitive. Because we have to carefully manipulate the paper to carefully turn the pages. That's a very delicate procedure, and I have to have lots of sensory information in my fingertips to do that. Same thing with your lips and your tongue. Forming words is very difficult. It requires a great deal of sensation to figure out where my tongue is in relation to my mouth, in relation to my teeth. So a great deal of sensation has to occur there. So there's a lot of neurons dedicated to those parts of the body, right? Think about it, paper cuts, so much more tragic than a little cut on your back, right? It hurt a lot more. You had a cuticle, you're like, it's the tiniest little cuticle in the world, but you just want to die. Right. They're like painkiller. Mm -hmm. I always buy the antibiotic cream that also has painkiller. Mm -hmm. And if I have a little cut on my back, I'm, I'm like, I barely even notice it's there. Sometimes I will get injured on a part of my body and not notice it for like two days. And someone will just say, what happened? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm a danger to myself. I'm very clumsy. Right? But if I get a cut on my finger, there is no mistaking it. Or a cut on my lip, yeah, right? Like if I get some sort of injury on my mouth, ah, ever get like a like burn your tongue? Cut on your leg, no big deal. Same cut on your leg, not as big a deal, right? So many more sensory neurons dedicated to these parts of the body, right? Right. All right, let's see. Yes? Adrenaline stops the signal, right? Uh, so endorphins. <coughs> endorphins are actually the, the is, endorphins actually act as a, both a hormone as well as a neurotransmitter. Remember, hormones are long-term messengers. Neurotransmitters are just right here, the synapse messengers. And it's actually endorphins that are heavily involved in pain regulation when endorphins get released. Yep. It's called, endorphins are an endogenous opioid. We'll get to that next time. That's our part of our nap, our nap, our nap the next time. All right. So other big structures that you should know. All right, so other structures of the forebrain. What's the hypothalamus? What's it do? Which types of behaviors? Fighting, and mating. Yeah, so the hypothalamus is a structure of the forebrain that regulates the four Fs, right? Why? Because it, it, it regulates the pituitary gland. And that gland secretes hormones that regulates your appetite, feeding, your interest in the opposite sex, mating. Okay. You can, think it, you can think of an F to go with that word. I, should, I, I, I probably, right? Right? Fleeing and fighting. There are hormones that regulate those, those behaviors. And, uh, and epinephrine or adrenaline is one that does the fleeing and the fighting, right? So the hypothalamus is highly involved in those four behaviors. What's the thalamus? It, it relays the... Yeah, it's a relay center, right? It's a relay center. What, is the, what are the basal ganglia? Those are the motor movement, a forebrain structure, a subcortical structure involved in motor movement. The fine motor movement, where if you have damaged the basal ganglia, like those with Parkinson's disease, you, have, you start having difficulty in controlling your motor movements. Uh, other forebrain structures. What? The hippocampus does memory formation, right? Lives in the temporal lobe. We already talked about the amygdala, also in the forebrain structure, does emotional processing. <clears throat> what are the olfactory bulbs? 
Yeah, they do your sense of smell, right? They're a part. They're 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 a part of the brain, but they interact directly with the outside world, right? The olfactory bulbs, the very most bottom part of your brain, in the front. Your olfactory bulb, right above your nose. We talk, thalamus is the relay center. It takes in sensory information and sends it to the correct cortical lobe. Right? So, so it, with the exception of your sense of smell, all sensory information first goes to the thalamus. It's called the thalamic relay. Visual information, auditory information, pain, pressure, all that information is going to your thalamus first, with the exception of your sense of smell. That's being processed by your olfactory bulbs. Okay, so then we talked about the midbrain and the hindbrain. We spent less time talking about them, but they are sort of important. So the midbrain can be split up into two sections. What, what are those two sections called? The tectum and the tegmentum, right? And the midbrain doesn't really have any fun it doesn't really have any functions that are only processed there. For the most part, if you look at all the different functions that the midbrain does. It's also being regulated someplace else. But, you know, but then with the exception of uh, what function have we not talked about that you that you see in your nose is regulated in the midbrain? Haven't talked about it yet. Well, we talked about it the day we covered it. So what is the what what are the what are the what is the, what kind of things does the midbrain do? I'll wait for you to find that section of your nose. What kind of behavior? So sleep? Yeah, sleep. We haven't really talked about sleep and arousal yet, right? There are portions of your cerebral cortex that are involved in sleep and arousal, but really it's being heavily regulated by the midbrain. Sleep and arousal, heavily regulated by the midbrain. And there's this cool part of the midbrain called the paraaqueductal gray matter, which also does species-specific behaviors. So sort of similar to the hypothalamus. But these are going to be the neural circuits that do instinctual species-specific behaviors. Maternal behavior, fighting behaviors, mating behaviors. So the hypothalamus does that too, because that's because that's the hypothalamus regulates the hormones involved. The actual neural circuits that are responsible for this instinctual behaviors that we have when mothers and fathers interact with their children is really being regulated by this paraaqueductal gray matter in the midbrain. <clears throat> and there's the hindbrain. There's three parts of the hindbrain. What are the three parts of the hindbrain? Cerebellum. Cerebellum, which does what? So movement also, right? So both the basal ganglia and in the forebrain and the cerebellum and the hindbrain do motor movement. But so you can think of the basal ganglia as fine motor movement. Cerebellum allows you to stand upright and walk across the room at all, right? That sort of basic control of motor movement. And so then there's what are the two parts of the hindbrain? Yeah. The pons, which is, you know, sort of boring. And then there's the medulla oblongata. What could you not do if you did not have a medulla oblongata? Live at all, right? Because the medulla oblongata, or the brain stem, does things like heartbeat, respiration, vascular control, which is your blood vessels. You know, those basic bodily functions that allow you to stay alive at all. Right? The medulla oblongata, or the brain stem. Very non-conscious, right? Very non-conscious. So you can think about those, those processes that we talked about in the midbrain and the hindbrain are much less conscious and aware than the forebrain types of, of uh, behaviors and functioning. All right. <clears throat> Can you just lightly touch on pons? Sure. It's, uh, so the pons is a, is a part of the hindbrain, and the pons uh, really is a connector. When you look at when you look at what its main function is, it really does a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of connecting between hindbrain and forebrain. <coughs> And when we go over the five senses, what, you'll, what we'll see is a lot of the sensory information makes us stop in the pond, in the midbrain, and where it's doing so is uh, very typically in the ponds. So those, those, those neurons, those sensory neurons that, are, that come up through the spinal cord, through the brainstem, also go through the midbrain where they're, where they're processed in the ponds, that sensory information. It doesn't do anything cool. All right, let's see. So, <clears throat> so, let's, so we've spent a great deal of time talking about the brain now, right? Let's talk about the spinal cord, the other part of the central nervous system. <coughs> Tell me about it. It's an extension of the brain. It is an extension of the brain, right? It, so it's also made of neurons, right? So tell me about it. What's it like? Very slender, right? It's surrounded by these very big, uh, you know, spinal column bones, the vertebrae, invertebrate species, right? Uh, and it's a very, but it's thin. It's just a bundle of axons. That's what it is. The spinal cord is a, is a about as thick as your pinky bundle of axons, and it's organized into pairs of what? Roots. That's right. Pairs of roots, little pairs of roots all down your spinal cord. There's a dorsal root and a ventral root for each pair of roots. Dorsal is closer to the top of the back. Ventral is closer to your stomach, the underneath part. And these axons come in two varieties, organized into roots. What are those two varieties? Afferent and efferent, right? So the and so tell me about the dorsal roots then. Dorsal roots are sensory. Yeah, the dorsal roots, the ones on top, are sensory, are afferent. Remember the word same, S A M E. The dorsal roots, the one on top, are sensory, afferent. The ventral roots, the one on the bottom, are what? Motor, efferent. So which ones are ingoing? Afferent. Afferent, sensory information is going along the dorsal root, the top root. Going along these, this top root is the sensory afferent information, this afferent axons. Motor movements, outgoing information, is traveling along the ventral roots. The ventral roots. And then, does that make sense? And so then we can quickly move to the peripheral nervous system now, because what is sort of an extension of the spinal cord? Also organized into afferent and efferent axons. What's connected to the spinal cord? That is a part of the peripheral nervous system. Nerves? Yeah, nerves, spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are connected to the spinal cord and they also have afferent and efferent axons, ingoing and outgoing messages. You have another set of nerves called the cranial nerves. They are not connected to your spinal cord, but they work the exact same way, just they do so for your head, your cranium. Both outgoing and ingoing messages. Sensory, ingoing, afferent axons. Outgoing, motor, efferent axons. Spinal cord and the spinal nerves and your cranial nerves are organized in the same fashion, the same way. And your two sets of nerves, the spinal and cranial nerves, make up the somatic peripheral nervous system, right? But there's another ask. There's another part of your peripheral nervous system. What's it called? Autonomic, right? The autonomic, autonomic, tomato, tomato, right? Right, and it has two sections, right? But it does all kinds of automatic functionings. Autonomic nervous system does a whole lot of stuff that you are probably not even aware of. Autonomic, it's happening so automatically, you're probably not even aware of, like, filling up your bladder. Are you consciously aware of your bladder filling up as it's filling up? No, you only become consciously aware of it when it's full. 
steps. And you're like, oh, I better go use the restroom, right? You don't, you don't consciously control your bladder filling up, right? It just sort of happens. You don't, what, or pupil dilation. Do you control your pupils dilating? No. Right? When it's when the police officer shines that flashlight in your eyes, you cannot control its dilation. Can't do it, right? So there's two sections of this autonomic nervous system. What are these two sections? Sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? And just sort of remember that the sympathetic, you're being sympathetic with the environment. Active processes, things like reactions, like people dilation, and urinary output are great examples of the of, of processes that are going on in a sympathetic nervous system. Also, your muscles in an active state, when you're running or moving, the control of those muscles, you may be aware of it as you clench your muscles really tight, but for the most part, it's unconscious. You don't even think about it. Active state is which, which division? Sympathetic. And so what is the parasympathetic division then? Yeah, when muscles are at rest and digestion, right? Rest and digest. Rest and digest. The parasympathetic nervous system, resting and digest digesting. Because after I have eaten a giant pizza, I am essentially paralyzed, laying on the couch, not moving, digesting my pizza. Parasympathetic. Right? Too. 
Yeah, so the meninges surrounds, encases, protects, and supports your entire central nervous system. Both your brain and your spinal cord are completely surrounded by the meninges. Right? Okay, so, so, but you should probably know way more than that. Because without these meninges, it would be difficult to be alive. Because, yes. It has three layers. It does, the three layers, absolutely. So it has three layers. What is the outermost layer? Dura the dura matter is the closest to the skull, right? Or closest to the surface of the, of, of, in the spinal cord. Just think about the spinal cord as an extension of the brain, because it really it is. So the outermost layer is the dura matter. Means hard mother. What, what does the dura matter do? What is it like? Describe it for, to me. It is thick, tough, and flexible. Thick, tough, and flexible, like a trampoline. Right? Anyone ever jump on a trampoline? So dangerous, so scary. My son just loves jumping on trampolines. But every time he jumps, I'm all, ah. I don't want to be that mother. He goes, no fun things for you. No. So he jumps on the trampoline, right? He jumps on the trampoline, and it's tough and flexible, right? It's thick. You try cutting a, a trampoline with scissors. Good luck with that. But it's completely flexible. It gives. It's a shock absorber, right? So that when you go like this, when you rock back and forth, it's absorbing even the minor shock that your brain going back and forth inside your skull is creating. Or when you hit your head hard, it absorbs, tries to absorb as much of that shock as it can. It's fibrous. It's tough fibers. Tough mother, outermost. Do you hear all that information that I, we now know? I talked about where it was. In cases and surrounds, the outermost layer. I described what it was made of. It's made of tough fibers. And I described what it did. Shock absorber. Tough and flexible. See all that information that I gave you? Mm -hmm. Pretty detailed, right? Mm -hmm. I recommend you know that, that level of detail. Is it just on top or is it like... It surrounds the entire nervous system. So it completely surrounds the brain and it surrounds the spinal column. Think of them as like bags, right? Bags that completely surround, like, so if you're, everyone ever played with one of those like vacuum bags? Where like you put your stuff in a bag and you stick the vacuum home up to it and it like so Imagine someone did that to your whole brain and spinal cord. And so it completely surrounds both your brain and your spinal cord. And that's but, just for human brain? Nope, for, for all mammalian brains. So it's that tight around, it's not like a, like, you know, when you get something from maybe Amazon or something, you get these bags full of air? No, it's, it, it is right up next to it. Okay. Right up next to it. There is no, there is no, there, there is a no vacancy side in your skull. There is no empty room inside your skull. Oh, your skull. You know what I mean? There's, there, they, right? There are empty spaces. What do we call them? Ventricles, right? But even they're not empty. They're filled with cerebral spinal fluid, right? There's no, there, there's no, like, hollow spaces. So those are the bubbles, those things you're talking about. Well, they're not bubbles. They're big, empty spaces called ventricles, filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So the outermost meninges is the dura matter, right? OK, what's underneath the dura matter? The arachnoid membrane, which really works together with this thing called the subarachnoid space, right? The subarachnoid space. The arachnoid membrane, well, OK, great. What's it like? What's it do? Yeah, it looks like a spider web. It has it's highly vascular, meaning it's filled with blood vessels. It's right underneath the dura mater, and it cushions the brain. And it really works with this little space underneath itself called the subarachnoid space, which is filled with cerebral spinal fluid that also cushions the brain. The subarachnoid space and the arachnoid membrane work together. But do you hear that level of detail? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Underneath the dura mater. What's it made of? Highly vascular tissue. What's it do? Cushions the brain. What does it work with? The subarachnoid space. What in the world is the subarachnoid space? And where is it? It's right underneath the dura mater. What's it do? It also cushions the brain and is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Do you hear that level of detail? Mm -hmm. All right, but there's one more meninges, right? The pia mater means delicate mother. What's it like? Where is it? On the surface of the brain. It 
clings to the surface of the brain like saran wrap. It is very thin, very delicate. And it supports the brain as opposed to protects it. It's part of the vascular system, the pia mater. It's thin and delicate, not sensitive. It doesn't have any, there are no pain receptors on your pia mater. Does it provide it with nutrients? Well, it's provides it with support, not, not just nutrients, but a lot of the stuff your brain needs in terms of not just nutrients, but like other chemicals and, and are also come to the brain through a variety of routes, but one of the ways is through the pia mater. Right? 